as well help paint uh, <laughs> since you're here anyway, right? So I, I have a unique opportunity to, I mean, I love being in the men's Bible class here on Tuesday mornings. It is absolutely uh, amazing. Uh, Lynn Henley is uh, leading that one, facilitating, teaching, and does a great job with that. And then, and then after that, I get to go into the ladies' Bible class, and wow, it is, it, it just blows my mind every week. And that, y'all, y'all might say, why are you in the ladies' Bible class? Uh, because right now I'm facilitating that one, I'm leading that one. So it is so different. Y'all, y'all just ain't got a clue. I'm the only one here that has a clue as to the differences in these two uh, classes. And uh, absolutely amazing. I love Tuesdays being here for the men's Bible class and then Tuesdays for the ladies' Bible class and, and, and all. It is wonderful. So I'm saying that to say, if you'd like to come, come be a part of that. Just not this Tuesday. Uh, next, <laughs> next Tuesday, uh, come be a part, part of all that. So uh, we have going on here throughout the week, and it's exciting to have these things going on because, you know, we kind of had a year off, and um, of no Bible classes, uh, hardly anything going on, and to see the excitement, to see the energy that we have here now is amazing, and I uh, would love for you to continue to be a part of those and other things that we have going on in the, in the future here as well. So, church today... As you heard in our uh, uh, reading this morning that uh, Reuben did for us from, uh, from, from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, we're going to be looking at that a little bit um, in the letter to the Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Let me go ahead and read that for you again, if you'd like. The Apostle Paul writes these words, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, we, we know that. We, we've read those verses so many times. A lot of you probably have it memorized, which is great. Let's think about this. Let's think about the Apostle Paul. He wasn't always a nice man, right? Agree with me. He was not a nice man. I mean, I don't know if you should do your head this way or this way. He was not a good guy and persecuting Christians. I mean, he was killing us, church. He was killing us, Christians, And not a very nice guy. And here we have him talking about love and joy and peace and patience and all this other great stuff. But he made a huge, huge turnaround in his life. We could go, and two weeks ago we talked about um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? And focused in on that a little bit. Who wrote that letter? Paul, this same guy. Wrote that. And he's talking about love. Loving people. Love, love, love. You know, if I had lived back during that time, and he'd been trying to kill me, and he made that big change, I'm sorry, I got some trust issues going on. And I might not be able, hey, Paul's preaching this week, doing a meeting. And we're going to have a potluck afterwards. <laughs> Y'all go enjoy it. <laughs> I'll, I'll zoom that one. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to go. Hmm. You have to understand the people that were around during that time and how they were feeling about a guy who was killing them, persecuting, killing them. All of this. Now he's writing about love. So we get to the end there. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and he says, Hey, you know what? You know what remains? Yeah, what remains? Three things. These three things. What are they? Faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. These three remain. Oh, and by the way, you know what the greatest of these is? Uh, Let's love folks. Now, we all know that. We teach our children. Love people, right? Love people. Love people. Love people. Unless they're driving on Highway 98. (laughs) We don't love them. And we're not rude to them. Right? That was two weeks ago, that lesson. That was a difficult one. Don't be rude. Be kind. Be kind. Even to people out on Highway 98. Love. Love people. So, I tell you, just putting materials together for a lesson on love is pretty overwhelming. The whole Bible is about God's love for us. 
And we can see God's work, God's plan, and what He has done for us throughout the Bible. And so I will not try today to cover everything on love because I cannot do that. There's no way. In fact, I was thinking, well, what if I just turn love into a long series? And I guess for a year or two, we would be talking about nothing but God's love and different aspects of it, which isn't a bad thing, don't get me wrong. But uh, for today's lesson, we're going to look here on the fruit of the Spirit and talk about love. Talk about love this morning. One thing that ought to be evident to everybody when they see us as Christians is Christ-like love in our lives. People should see that. Do they see that? Do they see that with you? When people look at you, do they see love? And, And exactly what does that even look like? Do they see it? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe we need to work on how people see us and do they see the love of Christ in us. Hmm. So, we're going to discuss that a little bit today. There is a need of, for love in our world. A world that desperately needs love. Even though society glorifies the subject of love, there's so little evidence of love around us today. But I think also we might be a little misguided on what love is. Society seems to equate sex with love. Many people can engage in that without a slightest hint of love. Others think that indulgence is love. You know, if I buy my child everything they want, they're going to love me, right? I get them anything they want. I have a 14-year-old. He'll be 16 in a little over a year. He wants a new Maserati. I said, go talk to your grandparents on that one. Oh, I could get him stuff. But does that equate to love? Well, how much we give to somebody, is that that just, you know, give them stuff, give them trinkets, give them this, give them that. You know, is indulgence love? I don't think so. I don't think so. By the way, an aside to that, my son is not here with us today, neither is my wife. They are with the youth, with Brandon, up in Montgomery on a mission field, and, and we need to remember them in our prayer uh, today as well for the good things um, and, 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 uh, that they are doing up there in the inner city in Montgomery. Um, so excited for, for, for all of them. So, indulgence isn't love. Tolerance, well, that's not really love either. Uh, you know, we need to be tolerant of, uh, of one another. No matter what your lifestyle might be, we need to be tolerant of it. And that might be saying, okay, you do your thing and I'll do my thing and I'll just be tolerant of you. Was that love? Just being tolerant? Just being tolerant? You know, if I understand the Bible correctly, if somebody's living a life that that's leading them to hell, you know, maybe I should say something. You think so? Maybe I ought to mention to them, you know, you know, there's a better way. Should I be tolerant of sin? Come on, church. Absolutely not. I can love people, right? And I can love, maybe, maybe I can love the sin out of them, right? You love people anyway, even though they have sin in their lives, because as good Christian folks, we have no sin in our lives, so we need to help those people. Y'all know that's not true. We all stumble, and we have different kinds of sins, right? Different ones. And sometimes we look at people and say, I don't know how in the world they could have whatever sin it is in their lives. Huh. Well, maybe that's a struggle they have, and maybe not one that you have. They're all different. Love people. Love people. Love people anyway. Love people. 
I think love misunderstood. You know, um, our language, when we see love, most other languages have several words to express different kinds of love. Our language, basically one word, and we use it in so many different ways. You know, we, we, we see people uh, locked in an embrace under a palm tree on a beautiful night and, and, and hear them say, I love you, right? I love you. That love, well, sure. Same couple later on, they're eating in a Mexican restaurant. Ooh, I love chimichangas. Chimichangas and tacos. Burritos. I love burrito, burritos, tacos. And all of y'all are getting hungry right now thinking about where you're going to eat at lunch, right? Love people. And, and now loving tacos. And then, and then sometimes people say, you know what I love? Boy, I love sports. I, oh, I love the Alabama Crimson Tide. Oh, they're the greatest team ever. A lot of our Tennessee folks are here today, and they love their Tennessee volunteers, right? Oh, loving things, loving things. Oh, I, lo I love my boat. <laughs> yeah, did y'all know I got a boat? <laughs> anyway, just had to throw that in there, L loving things. So we use the same word, loving people, loving food, loving things, loving boats, loving the cowboys, loving the Tennessee volunteers or the Crimson Tide or the Auburn Tigers, and we use that same word over and over. Ralph Sockman said, love is an overworked word for an underemployed emotion. Uh, I believe he's right. We use it all the time. And I think society misunderstands what love really is. Thirdly, love is missing. You know, there's news items every day. You look at your news, the absence of love is so prevalent in our society. The absence of love. You know, people want, love one another. You know, if I really loved you, I wouldn't steal your hubcaps. I wouldn't break into your home. I wouldn't take what was mine. I wouldn't be doing this, wouldn't be doing that if I truly loved people. Loving people no matter what. No matter where they are. Showing acts of kindness, acts of, acts of love. There's a couple was driving down a highway. I saw a woman walking along on the highway. She's carrying a baby. takes just a few minutes to react and going down the highway and they saw her and, and then they saw her car with a flat tire and, and the wife said, you know, stop and, and also he slowed down and he stopped, went back to where the woman was. By that time, four other cars had pulled up to help her. There are moments when we're stirred to be loving and kind. So this happened a few years ago. Rhonda and I were going somewhere and we were in our car and uh, we got to where we were going and, and we were getting ready to go inside. And it was raining. We lived, um, I, th I think we lived in uh, San Antonio at the time. And I was looking around the car and said, what are you looking for? And I said, the umbrella. I said, Rhonda, what did you do with the umbrella? Rhonda, because I know I didn't do anything with it. It must have been her, right? Rhonda, where's the umbrella? Can't find the umbrella. Looking all around. He said, uh, well, well, Gary, we don't have an umbrella. I said, sweetie, we got an umbrella. I know we got an umbrella. It's an Air Force issued umbrella. It's got a serial number on it. I said, we have an umbrella. She said, Gary, we don't have an umbrella. I said, Rhonda, we have an umbrella. Married folks, y'all ever have these kinds of conversations with your spouse? Maybe it's just us. Maybe it's only us. I said, no, Gary, we do not have an umbrella. I said, okay. Rhonda, where's our umbrella? Gary, there was a lady walking down the street, had a child, and it was raining. They didn't have an umbrella. Now they do. Guys, you ever felt like you're the biggest idiot? That there's ever been at times like that. It's like, ah, 
I'm arguing with Rhonda about an umbrella, and she gives it away to somebody who needs it because she loves people. Taking care of people, loving people, everyday life, no matter what, love people. And sometimes people are difficult to love. People are difficult to love. And, 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 and you know, there are single parents out there who, who are lonely and tired being both mom and dad, their kids, struggling to keep their heads above water. You know, how do we love these types of people or the ones who are taking care of, of, of aging relatives and they need help 24 hours a day and, and they're just getting a little tired of the responsibility? Or the teenagers who cry out for attention, for someone to listen to them. Well, let me tell you, love hears, love understands. Love hears, love understands. Love is also an action. Helping doing, but simply because loving people. John 13, 34, 35. A new commandment I give you, love one another. Jesus saying this, right? New commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. All men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Folks, we're supposed to love each other. All the time. Even when we're unlovely, we love one another. All the time. There's dysfunction in families. There's dysfunction in churches. People seeking love. There was a story a while back of a, of a young lady who, who was talking about a relationship with her, with her crystal. And the love that she receives from it. How she sleeps with this crystal. When she wakes in the morning, she can feel love emanating from this crystal. You can't help but, but, but think how sad it is to be so starved for love as to, seek, as to sleep with a rock and to think that that is a source of love. Folks, that is sad. You're getting love from a rock? So then we see the perfect example of love. We'll look over to John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Great story. Sad story. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. John appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. Teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and they said to Jesus, I mean, just starting off there, hey, poor woman. said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? John adds a footnote there in verse 6. He says they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Hmm. So here's the scene. You see it. They're in Jerusalem. It's crowded. Festive time. Some people are engaging and drinking and drunkenness and immorality. You know, time to get caught in the act of adultery. And that's exactly what happened. So here comes a crowd bringing this woman who's been caught in the act of adultery. They make her stand before Jesus. She's guilty. She's guilty. There's no question. She is guilty. Being caught in the act of adultery. But then notice here what Jesus what Jesus does. Last part of verse 6. Jesus bent down. He started right on the ground with his finger. I, I can't help read this. I wonder his thought process. You, you know, I mean, is he thinking, you guys... bringing this woman caught in adultery... Writing on the ground with his finger. Don't know what he wrote. Say, 
But it doesn't matter nearly as much what Jesus wrote as what he was doing. Jesus here was giving them an opportunity to reconsider, to think about what they're doing. He's giving them an opportunity to drop the stories that they're holding. They don't do any of this. Verses 7 through 9, it says, When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up to them. If one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down, he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, till only Jesus was left with the woman. Still, she was still standing there. This is one of these awesome, awesome times in Scripture when a sinner and the Savior stand face to face. doesn't condone her sin. He doesn't condemn her. He condemns her sin. He does not condemn her. So here they are, just the two of them, face to face, sinner and Savior. And he asks, woman, well, where are they? No one condemns you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now, leave your life of sin. What an awesome story here. What an awesome, awesome story. So many lessons here for us. The reason I think this story is important, because I think we're in this picture too. Our list of sins may be different, but we're in the same boat that she is in. We stand condemned before the Savior just as she was. And it can be so easy for us to be like the scribes and the Pharisees, pointing their long bony fingers, stones in hand, ready to condemn her, ready, ready to have a good stone in that day. They were trying to trap Jesus. But he turned the tables on them, and the crowd slinked away. The only one there who had a right to throw a stone was Jesus Christ himself. And he didn't want to throw stones. Wow, that sure gives us hope, doesn't it? What a story. Let's apply this. Love meets the needs of others before it meets the wants of self. Don't tell them Jesus loves them until you're ready to love them too. You know, I can preach dozens and dozens of sermons on the subject of love, but one act of love on your part will communicate better than all the sermons that I might preach. Just simply loving people. Loving people. And what does that look like? I mean, what in this world does that look like? We don't know people all around us all the time. You go into stores, you go to places, you go to shop, whatever it is. What does love, what does love, what does that look like? You know, sometimes it might be to where, to where you see somebody in line at, at, at the grocery store. And, and, and you ever been there and you see people, they don't have enough money. And they start having to take things out of their grocery uh, on, the, on the line there, they have to put things back. Maybe some of you have been there where you got to put stuff back. Loving people might mean helping them pay their bill. Loving people I was in a convenience store the other day, and a young lady, I've seen her in there before, and checking me out, and I said, how are you doing? She says, I'm doing good. I don't know, something about her eyes looked different. There was no one else in there. There was another uh, cashier. I said, are you really doing well? 
Is there something wrong? She says, well, you wouldn't want to listen. I said, yeah, I would. I said, what's going on in your life? She started opening up and talking to me about some stuff. Things that were going on in her life. You know, sometimes what I have learned in counseling is sometimes people just need somebody to listen to them. She needed somebody to listen to me. And I don't know, this store, this store is normally busy, but for whatever reason, <laughs> there weren't people coming in. And quite honestly, I was in a hurry too, you know, I needed to go. I, I really needed to go because I just want to run in there and back out. I bought a couple of items. I set them back on the counter. I said, tell me, talk to me. And like I said, she did. And she opened up her heart and her life to me and told me some different things that were going on. And, and I listened. I didn't offer any profound advice as I'm prone to do. No. There was sin in her life. There was some ugliness. There was some hurt. She needed someone to talk to. I, I tell you, we can listen, church. What does love look like? It, it can look like listening. It can look like slowing down and taking a few more minutes. Loving people where they are. Loving people, knowing their sin in their lives as, as there are in ours. And, and we come every week to our recovery group for sinners. We meet here. We encourage one another. Loving people. As a Christian community, we need to learn to meet the needs of others. Our culture says you, want your want, you meet your wants first, and maybe you might try to meet the needs of others. Oh, we love people. Second application here is love leads people to Christ. Love is infectious. A world that's starved for love, if the church will learn this principle, will be a loving community, it will draw people to Christ. It will draw people to Christ. Okay? Love people. People want part of that. People will see that. No, it doesn't mean just necessarily having a bumper sticker like we have back here that says Destin Church Christ on it. And please, if you put one of those on your car, don't cut people off down, down on 98. We don't need phone calls here. <laughs> but if, they, if you do and the people get your tag number, we'll put it up here on the screen for everyone to see. <laughs> oh, that wouldn't be very loving. Love people where they are. People will see that. People will want to know what it is about you. Not a fake love, but a genuine love, a genuine concern for people just like Jesus had there. I, I tell you, that, that, that story of the woman caught in adultery is so powerful. So powerful. Loving people. The story's told there was a preacher who was riding on a bus and a drunk came stumbling on the bus and he sat down next to him and the preacher immediately took out his Bible because that's what we preachers do. When drunks sit down next to us, we take out our Bible. Yeah. And we begin reading scriptures to him. The preacher announced to the drunk, do you know that you're going to hell? And the drunk said, oh no, I got on the wrong bus again. No, we don't beat people over the head with the Bible. We love people, not beat them over the head with the Bible. We need to communicate a message of love for letting that love, we need to let that love lead people to Christ. And third application is this, love sees people for what they can become rather than what they are. Love sees people for what they can become rather than what they are right now. This woman, she must have been a pitiful sight there. The woman caught in adultery. Tears, I would imagine, were streaming down her face. I don't know. I wasn't there. The Bible doesn't say. But I can imagine she felt like the most lonely person in the world. 
clothing probably all messed up, guilty as she could be of the sin she committed. Yet Jesus looked at her and he sees her for what she can become rather than what she is. 1 Corinthians 6, Apostle Paul paints a picture of what a church really is. He talks about how the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Then he gives a long list of those who will not get into heaven. And, 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 and he talks about the sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, prostitutes, uh, homosexuals, thieves, greedy, drunk, uh, greedy, drunkards, slanderers, swindlers. None of these, he says, will inherit the kingdom of God. Then he says, this is what some of you were. Because he goes on there, this is what some of you were. Ho! Oh. Some of these people that he's talking to were all these things? Those are pretty rough folks. You see, we're standing beside this woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Church, we're, we, we're standing right next to her. We're all sinners too. But then Paul, the Apostle Paul says, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Listen to that. Is that not good? Yeah. Let me say that again. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Church, we're no different than that woman. So we've been washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of Jesus, Spirit of God. We're standing there next to her. Church, as I close this morning, I want to encourage you that more than anything else, we need to be a community of love here. More than anything, I want to be able to come here. I want to feel totally, completely loved. I want us to love others as God has loved us. I want us to be a magnet to people seeking God's love, drawing a world that's starving for love in the presence of Christ. That's what we can become. Absolutely, right? Amen. Do your heads this way. Yes. Loving people anyway. Church, this morning, let me tell you, if you have need of the Lord's invitation, if there's things going on in your life you need prayers for, if there's whatever it is, I don't know what all the needs could be. You might have needs I've never even thought of. If you have some needs this morning and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we want you to do that. If you need to be baptized, we want you to do that. If you don't want to come forward, that's okay. You can get with myself, one of the elders, somebody else. If you need the prayers, whatever it might be. We're here for you. To our guest, keep our bulletin. Our phone numbers are in there. We're your church while you're down here, okay? Phone numbers, our emails. Feel free to call or text me. I don't know if our elders text or not. I think they do. Call them. We're here for you, okay? We love you. We're so happy you're here with us today. Uh, coming to worship God while you're away on vacation. What a great way to start your week. Church, if there's anyone here today that has need of the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come right now while together we stand, while we sing.